the other organizers yeah, for giving this opportunity to be these lectures. Okay, so um, understand the question asked in the previous lecture that most of you are physicists. But now my follow-up question is how many of you know about photosynthesis? Okay, uh, a few of you. Okay. Well, in fact, I was not interested in photosynthesis at all during school, during my undergrad studies. Um, in fact, I did not even take biology in school. I thought, well, let me just focus on the understanding subjects, and you know, biology was too much to, to memorize. And I actually regret that. That is a very important part, I think, of my education, which I missed. But at the other hand, now I've got a training as a physicist, now I can step into this domain of biophysics as a physicist and you know, get a completely different perspective on the problems. Um, today I'm going to um, just introduce a number of concepts in photo photosynthetic light harvesting. And I'm glad that I can devote a whole lecture to that, because normally in the talks it's just briefly um, showing a few concepts and then going to the experimental techniques and a bit of the theory. And especially the physics audience, um, now you need to spend a bit of time in the biological context in order to appreciate the physics which you use in that context. So I hope that for well, this main purpose of this lecture. Before I kick off, I would like to mention that biophysics in South Africa is still in its infancy. So, um, okay. well, so the South African Institute of Physics has its own biophysics initiative. We are still very small, um, but the main purpose of this initiative is to advance biophysics in South Africa. Um, at the moment, it's still on the level of research, but um, in a few years we hope that we can also set up some curricula on an undergrad um, level. So, we have our own website, it is, uh, there's still very limited information on it, it's still under construction. If for those who saw this slide, or this sentence the previous time, um, but we are still working on, on, the, on the website. Um, but yeah, we hope that soon uh, um, students and other scientists interested in biophysics can also subscribe and sign up and then we can start to form a whole community in that. Right. Um, okay, the design principles in photosynthetic light harvesting. So I divided my lectures into um, four different ones. And today I will give you an introduction to some of the concepts. And tomorrow we are going to delve into the, the physics, underlying physics. Uh, Wednesday, um, I'm just briefly going to show you some of the experimental developments, some of the main experimental techniques that are being used. And then on Thursday, my last lecture, will deal with my own research findings. Okay. Okay, starting with photosynthesis. So this is the main process, very globally, we can say. Uh, we start with water, light, and carbon dioxide. We want to produce biomass and oxygen. And photosynthesis is responsible for <coughs> conversion of the incident solar energy of about 120,000 terawatts, and we are produce about 120 terawatts of biomass. Pretty remarkable. Really on a very, very large scale. If you compare it to um, what humans produce annually, with all the different energy resources, it's only about 17 terawatts. Okay, photosynthesis actually plays a much larger role than most of us realize. You just think about it. Um, basically, all the food we eat is directly or indirectly related to photosynthesis. The, the air, the oxygen we breathe, the um, fossil fuels. So, you know, none of life can exist without the process of photosynthesis. And if you also step back and just think about this global formula, so in photosynthesis only very basic elements are being used. Light, water, carbon dioxide, and some of the minerals in the soil. And what do you get out of this? You get energy in very utilizable forms, biomass. The whole food chain is based on just this simple 
formula which actually comprises a very complex chain of events. Okay, so here's just another slide to illustrate the importance of photosynthesis. So photosynthesis is responsible for producing about 105 billion tons of biomass per year. Okay, um, there is a whole gallery of light harvesting complexes. The most familiar ones to us are from higher plants, vascular plants. But in fact, most photosynthesis is not produced by plants, it's produced in the oceans by plankton. Do you have a whole different range of other organisms that also photosynthesize? And here are a few light harvesting complexes from plants, light harvesting complex 2, photosystem 1, I'll come back to all of these. And there's a whole bunch of bacterial systems that also photosynthesize under very extreme conditions. For bacteria are really remarkable things. And we have species of bacteria that survive under all types of conditions. We have, yeah, even bacteria that survive in volcanoes, and bacteria that survive at the bottom of the sea where there's no light and no um, yeah, where the temperature is very low. Not all of them can photosynthesize, of course, because you need light. But you get some other remarkable species, um, so one that is not shown here, but for example, which survives um, a few hundreds of meters below the surface of the sea, um, which gets one photon every few seconds, and on that it actually survives. Okay, phytobilism from cyanobacteria to diatoms, and in all the light arts and comets have different shapes and different colors, and the plant ones cover, for example, the blue and the red parts of the optical spectrum. Bacterial ones shifted normally more to the near infrared. And some of the other systems cover more the green parts to the near infrared. So a combination of them just gives you a whole gallery and they can cover almost the entire, the entire solar spectrum. Okay, what is very remarkable about light house comets is if you were to compare them to, say, just the normal semiconductor silicon-based solar cells, that these light harvesting complexes are much more disordered. It's a living system. They're often described as wet and messy, but warm. It's nothing like the very neat crystalline structures that we normally associate solar cells with. But these systems are really remarkable for, for photosynthesis, for light harvesting. They are extremely fine-tuned and extremely robust. So they, they make use of a whole list of design motives, one can say. And with this, and with just basic elements, it, it harvests light at an extremely high efficiency and also an extremely high um, robustness because it can also switch between very efficient light harvesting, very efficient um, photoprotection, all these concepts I want to use in this talk. So just to mention a few of these design motives, we have an extremely high pigment density and a very high number of pigments per reaction center. Um, okay, the concept of reaction center I will also come back to. So it, uh, they have a very broad absorption profile, so they can cover a very large extent of the solar spectrum to capture as many as uh, many photons as possible. Uh, the excitation energy transfer is very efficient, the electron transfer is efficient because excitations, photons that are absorbed, absorbed, are converted into electrons and they drive subsequent processes. Um, as I mentioned, these systems are very robust, they have uh, fairly large parameter insensitivity, so if you would shift the uh, positions of, of the, the pigments that are responsible for absorbing light a little bit, they will still be very efficient. And it's, they can also adjust again. The antenna sizes can be adjusted. There are so many parameters that can be adjusted. Uh, also has robustness in the form of graceful degradation. That's another point I'll come back to. That these systems can degrade, they can disassemble very quickly and reassemble uh, depending on the light conditions, depending on the local environments they experience. Okay, and they are optimal in station transfer. The energy they absorb, um, the pigments coupled to proteins form a network in a very precise way so as to ensure very efficient light harvesting and transfer of energy. 
and also this further damage that we've paid, which happens very often. The system is also protected against that, protected against you know, many things that can, in principle, go wrong. Okay, so the first aspect I'd like to look at is the supramolecular organization. So starting from a plane D, as we are zooming into this, um, seeing different cells, and we know that plants are green because of the chloroplast, so the, the cells, the plant cells typically are different from animal cells due to mainly the chloroplast. But of course it's a cell membrane, some other aspects as well. One of the main issues is the chloroplast. Animal cells don't they? Inside the chloroplast, chloroplast consists of folded membranes, and inside these membranes are all the complexes that are responsible for light harvesting and the first step of the synthesis. So inside this chloroplast you have the domains of stacked membranes that are called grana and between these grana are uh, the, the spaces are much wider and you have some other complexes that are inside them. So yes, just another representation of this. So if we start with a leaf on a tree for example, we take a cross section of the diameter the so-called mesophyll cells, if we zoom into that, zoom into one of the chloroplasts, we see that it's full of folded membranes, and inside these membranes are then the four main types of so-called pigment protein complexes. So these are very large multi-domain proteins that come couple a whole bunch of, of different pigments, chromophores. So they are responsible for absorption of the light. Okay, the, the whole process of light harvesting can be divided into three steps. So you first have the absorption, capturing of the photons, then it's converted, then, then uh, it's, um, transported between all the different antenna complexes, and then it's stored. First as a charge separated state, so you have a potential difference, and then eventually it's stored into carbohydrates and some other forms. Just a question, these membranes, do they enclose something or are they just membranes as such with some edges? Do they enclose uh, uh, another object or are they just in free membranes? Um, okay, that's a good question. And yeah, I would also really encourage you to ask questions because I, I, I'm a stronger uh, experimentalist and as I told some other experimentalists um, we don't get the opportunity to write these many equations on the board. So please use the opportunity to ask questions while I'm going through this. So the question was um, whether these membranes are enclosing anything or not. Um, well, not really. Well, they are enclosing say, protons and some other proteins that are less important. But all the activity basically takes place inside the membranes. So these proteins are membrane-bound proteins. Now, so you have protons that get transferred through the membranes and change the, the boom and the pH and some other things and some other proteins that also approach the membrane from this side. But as I'll show you in the next slide, these membranes are also very compact. So um, yeah, it's quite hard to enclose something between that. Okay, so let's have a look at the different structures in the thylakoid membrane. So, there are two photosystems, photosystem 1 photosystem 2. So, photosystem 2 is actually the first in the whole chain of events. So why is that not called 1? It's because 1 was discovered first. So why it's called 1. And they are very similar in many aspects, but there are also essential differences. So these are um, two of the four main pigment protein um, super complexes, I would say. So the other two are cytochrome B6F and HP synthase. So just very briefly how they work. So for system 2, for system 1 we have there. Both of them contain more or less 200 chlorophylls, 50 carotenoids, so different types of carotenoids. These are the two types of pigments I will elaborate on in a moment. And then a few dozens of proteins. And both photosystems function as a unit, you could say. They consist of many different domains, and each protein is actually a, a 
a different domain and essentially has a different function, but combined, all of them also function as a unit, so as a whole photosystem, and the same photosystem one. Okay, now what happens upon absorption of a photon? Okay, you have energy transfer um, throughout the photosystem to the antenna systems, to the reaction center, and in the reaction center, charge separation takes place. So, proton is shuttled to the luminal part of the membrane, electron is shuttled to the stromal part, and you have a charge separated state. And so, you have an electron gradient, a proton gradient, uh, potential difference, and this will drive the subsequent reactions. Okay, so this is not the end of the story. Eventually, what we want to arrive at is to reduce NADP plus to NADPH. So that is used for carbon fixation. So that's eventually where the energy is stored into is fixated to these carbohydrates. And we also have HP synthase. So all the proteins that are shuttled to the luminal side, or not all of them, most of them are used to drive HP synthase. So to produce from ADP, ATP, and hopefully all of you by now know that ATP is the universal unit of energy in biological systems. So that form of energy is then used in all sorts of different processes in the system. So NADPH, ATP, that's where the energy is eventually stored into. Right, so protons are not only shuttled through the photosystems, but also by the so-called cytochrome B6F, which is responsible for shuttling protons to the membrane and also for donating electrons to photosystem 1. Photosystem 2 is different in this aspect that it extracts its electrons from water. So why? It's because water is you know, the most abundant molecule present from which you can extract electrons, but it's not a very simple process to do that because the strongest oxidizing um, or oxidizer in the maybe the universe or on planet Earth is a so-called manganese cluster that is coupled to water. So in order to oxidize the water, to extract oxygen, protons and electrons. So oxygen is not used that much by plants, so most of that is given off by um, as a byproduct, and that again sustains a, a whole different, well, um, many other forms of, of life. Okay, so first, system two extracts electrons from water. First, system one gets it from say from B6F, uh, in which the electrons are actually um, well, in a cycle, and through a cycle, protons as well. Okay, so in the end, said all of this. So in the end, the minimum number of photons required to reduce one CO2 and to produce one oxygen is eight photons. Okay, and this gives us an efficiency of at most 25 percent. So if you would excite the chlorophylls at its um, rate-most energy, where Basically, all the energy will be used eventually until you have fixed this energy um, in carbohydrates and ATP. The total efficiency is about 25%. Well, the total efficiency of the very first process from capturing of the photon until you have the charge separation that's essentially 100%. That means that essentially every photon's energy is used to generate a charge separated state. Okay. And more about the supermolecular organization. So, you have two different parts of the membrane, and this is just about two, but it illustrates how um, packed the different membranes are on top of each other. So, this is called the, the um, grana and the stromal part, uh, stromal mammalian. Okay, in this part, that consists mostly of folded membranes, so stacked like pancakes on top of one another. And there you have mostly photosystem 2. And then also one antenna complex called LHC2, which I'll come back to most of the talk a bit about that. That is LHC2 is one small part of photosystem 2. And this is the most abundant membrane-bound protein on Earth. It's also a very 
important and very relevant context to look at. Uh, name the stronger than any year of most of the other units, say first to one, ATP synthase, such from B6F. Okay, and what's interesting is NHC2 complexes, so it's basically a, a single antenna system, it can basically migrate between the two parts of the membrane, so the corona and the sternal membrane, depending on the light conditions. So in this um, way, the, the sizes of photosystem 1 and photosystem 2 can be regulated. And there are also molecular mechanisms responsible for that. Okay, um, about the membrane organization, maybe just to, to tune a bit into the topology, um, the main theme of this school, which is um, not my main focus in my research. Um, membrane organization, also a very interesting aspect and something that has only recently started to be appreciated in the community of photosynthetic light harvesting because it's a pretty complex process to, to combine this with all the other features of light harvesting. So this I would like to demonstrate for the bacterial light harvesting complex. Um, okay, from AFM, someone forced microscopy, these figures were obtained. And there you can see some antenna systems, and then large antenna systems with the reaction center they emit. But what is the effect of that? Um, or what's the effect of the membrane curvature on the organization? And that was done in the paper some five, six years ago, where a simulation was done. Um, and uh, the, the curvature of the, of the membrane was changed and by using Monte Carlo's simulation and uh, by just changing the, the curvature one looked at just two different sizes of, of complexes one is the, re the reaction center coupled to the light harvesting one complex which is a bigger system and the green one which is LX2 and by changing the curvature you, uh, they saw a uh, Organization. So when we started with, let me just go back to the stars. So we, we started with more or less a uh, random distribution of these complexes, um, but now just using this simulation and reducing the curvature, we could see that the larger particles would settle more to the flat parts, and the smaller particles will reside more in the curved parts. So you have a natural self-assembly. The system, just due to the curvature of the, the system. Okay, that's maybe all I want to say about this topology. Okay, PS2, which is a so called super complex. Okay, this is an electron micro micrograph. Okay, and why does the resolution seem to be so bad? It's because these systems are fluctuating very much in time. So, it does not really help you to average a lot because you, you are just um, getting this fuzzy picture. So I often say that electron microscopists have to be pretty creative. I mean, to take from this image to that one, but okay, it's not the only thing that I'm using. But these structures are based on crystal, uh, x ray crystallography, and all the individual systems have been crystallized and the structures have been found based on that. But anyway, so this appears to be super complex. In the center you have the so-called core complexes that also contain the reaction system and then you have some smaller units that are called minor antenna complexes and here you have the so-called LHC2. It's a bigger antenna system that's on the periphery of this complex. Okay, here it's also shown. Okay, now, excitation concentration is the second principle I just like to focus on. Okay, so system one um, gives a very nice um, conceptual view of the, the antenna system, which is normally surrounding the reaction center in the middle. Okay, so in this case, you have about 200 different chlorophylls that are surrounding, that are forming an antenna. They surround the antenna system in the middle. So, it's called excitation concentration. So you have a big antenna system, and why is it big? It's because 
Plants are designed, and many photosynthetic organisms are designed, to function optimally in dim light. It's much easier to switch off the photosynthetic capability than to increase it. Because if it's optimized to dim light, it can function optimally. It's designed for that. Okay. If you would take a normal sunlight, okay, I don't know really what they define as normal sunlight, it's probably European or some in North America, so it's not, not that bright. But okay, um, then normally in these antenna systems, on average, every chlorophyll pigment absorbs about 10 photons per second. So it's not very much. It's really not very much. So in order for this process to function optimally, you need a, a very large number of excitations and all of these excitations should be um, funneled to the reaction center and be used in the end. So normally the antenna system is much bigger than the reaction center, everything is just funneled inside. Okay, so the first process is absorption of the photon and then it's energy, it's shuttled in the antenna system goes to the core antenna system and then into the reaction center and there a proton is um, a proton and electron are then separated on opposite sides of the membrane which I already mentioned so this happens inside the reaction center and it should take place on a very fast time scale so in system 1 it takes place around 20 picoseconds why should it be so fast? So you can have charts recombination again, also on a pretty short time, time scale. The time scale of this is a few hundreds of picoseconds. So if you want to, to keep this um, energy, you should avoid charts recombination. And that's, that's why this whole process should be much faster than charts recombination. Okay. And the quantum efficiency from the bulk absorption of photon until you have this charts that is essentially one of the extremely efficient. Do the subsequent processes happen a lot slower than the war? Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, this is a very unstable form of energy. So mm -hmm. as soon as you have created more stable forms of energy, the process can slow down. Yeah. Okay. So um, is this another end? Yeah, is there, is there any loss in the uh, transfer of the photon from the antenna into the reaction sensor? And, or, or how exactly is it transferred? Okay, that's should. where the difficult physics comes in, of the theory. I'll come, I'll okay. explain that tomorrow. Yeah, it's based on the exciton concept. You know, are you familiar with excitons? Okay. And it also depends on the, the density of the pigments. So you, it's a combination between resonance and excitonic energy transfer. Okay. Um, Right, so if this process is repeated a couple of times, then what you have ended up with is essentially a biobattery and an extremely powerful biobattery. Of course, the membrane has a uh, width of about 4 nanometers and you have about 300 millivolts to create under normal sun conditions. So uh, the electric field that you get from this is, is pretty large. Yes? Does the um if you have high sunlight, does the reaction center ever get saturated with photons and that's a so really point. Yes, yes. Now that's exactly what happens. So I'm actually coming back to the point which I made about splitting water, a very remarkable process in nature. And the, the strongest oxidizing uh, unit in nature um, is used to split water. But because of this very strong oxi oxi um, uh, oxidizing capability, there's always a probability that you will damage the reaction center. And in fact, about every half an hour, on average, the reaction center is damaged and it has to be repaired. So it's taken apart completely and you can just imagine these 10 dozens of protein systems all have to be taken apart to reach the reaction center which has to be reassembled and the whole thing has to be reassembled every half an hour. And, yeah, and then especially if the reaction center is saturated. So if you have a charge separated state, then 
of one reaction center is saturated. So actually the electron and protons first have to be shuttled away before, and we call it the uh, reaction center is closed. If they get shuttled away, the reaction center becomes okay. Because only one charge separated state can be formed at the stage. Okay. So this is not a very realistic picture like this, it's more conception to show you it's a bi battery. But okay, we're dating that to the damage that occurs. So if you have a closed solar system, if you have a charge separated state, then the possibility of damage is much higher. And that's why I will come to a very important regulatory mechanism called photoprotection. That's mainly to protect the reaction center um, from too, too much light, too high irradiation levels. Okay, let's look at another design principle, pigments. Yes, there's another hand. Um, so I, I will observe the dynamics of the assembly of this reaction site under experimental conditions. Sorry, I did not hear that clearly. Um, my question is, are you able to observe the dynamics of the assembly of the reaction center under experimental conditions? Um, yes. The, in fact, I don't know a lot about that, but uh, that's work that's been done in the 80s, if I'm not mistaken. So I don't know to what level of detail they they managed to, to look into that disassembly and the reassembly. Um, in principle, it's, it's, it's a pretty difficult thing to investigate. And I think you'll appreciate more about that if I come to the experimental techniques, because these are very densely packed systems. So you need a whole different array of experimental techniques to get different perspectives and different pieces of information. Um, but most of, but you can get the most information if you completely isolate the system. So then you won't see the whole disassembly and assembly anymore. As soon as you have the whole system, the in vivo system, you're, um, it, it's very restricted how much information you can extract from that. Just because the, the system is, is very densely packed. Okay, so let's come to the pigments. Okay, LHC2 is the main system I'll focus on. So the structure was resolved first in you know, about 20 years ago and that was not a very remarkable resolution for that time it was okay but it was not good enough to resolve individual pigments the chlorophylls and the carotenoids but then a breakthrough came 10 years later the resolution of 2.7 um, on which all the individual pigments could be resolved so that was very nice then most of the modeling started because as soon as you have resolved the crystal structure, the precise orientations of all the pigments, then you can put it into your model, you can model excitation energy transfer, etc. Okay, and fortunately the German group was just too late, they actually got a better resolution, but it's not published in nature because it was the first. And okay, that was from P, which they got it, and then the Chinese group um, that it's same with the cucumber, so very similar resolution as they got. And essentially the structure is the same. So if you take um, all these higher plants, the structure is the same. There are some very, very minor differences, but essentially they are just the same. The same mechanisms are used in all these systems. Okay, so LHC2 okay, is one of the peripheral antenna systems, and it's actually a trimer of three almost identical subunits. So one subunit is called a monomer, combined three of them into a trimer. Okay, so here's one of the monomers. This really thing is called protein. I hope you have been introduced to proteins already in the school. A little bit silly. Well, proteins are really very remarkable things. Now, they are the molecular machines in all living systems. Right, one slide in uh, this talk in which I will just explain a few aspects of proteins. Okay, these proteins um, act mainly to couple or to coordinate or to bind different pigments in exact positions. So these are then exact structures in which the pigments are positioned in exact places and orientations to ensure very high efficiency of light absorption and transfer. Energy. Okay, we, these pigments are chlorophylls, and here are just the rings of chlorophylls, chlorophyll A and B in plants. 
in some other organisms, you have other types of growth, such as small growth, or C, and bacterial growth, you have A, B, C, D, and E. And these stick like structures are the carotenoids. And in two, you have four different types of carotenoids. I'll come back to that later. Okay, chlorophylls. Yes, Alex. Is there any difference between the monomers and the monomers? Can you speak up, please? Uh, the monomers are yes. most completely identical, but there are some minor differences between the different monomers. There are minor differences between them. I'm going to give you a, a few articles about that. Uh, the differences are, are not significant, but for example, the proteins themselves. Um, there are three different types of proteins, all part of the same family, but three different types that form these monomers. One type is most abundant than uh, the, the other two types. So, so this is one class, you have another class, a bit broader, in which the minor antennas also form, and essentially all the photosynthetic or, or all the photosynthetic light dancing proteins fall inside of the larger class. So all the proteins are very related, but there are some small differences. Uh, and you mentioned about the pro protein tertiary structure. You said the structure is in such a way that these pigments are in optimal position to harvest light. But is, doesn't this optimal position change depending on many factors? Like, say, even during the day, how the sunlight changes, or uh, doesn't that change? So, does the protein also dynamically change the structure, or does it not the same? Well, not on the level of the pigments. Um, okay, well, let me say yes. Yes, on all levels of organization there are changes. So the largest change is on the macroscopic level where the cells physically move and leaves move. But on this scale, and this is a point I'll make a bit later, the pigment density is extremely high. If you would change position by less than an angstrom, you will completely change the, the energy dynamics. And that actually happens. So the protein itself um, the point which I will make is the protein functions as an environmental sensor. So it senses the local environment and based on that the, 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 the fault of the protein changes a little bit and this affects the energy transfer extremely much. So from about 100% efficiency to you could say less than 10% just by very subtly changing the, 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 the conformation of the proteins and of course the pigments are strongly coupled to the protein. So She's also changed. Yes. Okay, chlorophylls. Um, speed up a little bit. So the essential part of the chlorophyll is the is the ring. So um, in the center you have the metal um, magnesium in the case of chlorophylls, tetrapyrrole ring, that's what the ring is called. If you would replace the magnesium with with iron, that is um, and then you would have um, part of hemoglobin, so um, yeah, the, the part of the red blood cell which shuttles the oxygen in your blood. Okay, essentially the same ring as here in chlorophyll. Okay, you see here um, double bonds, single bonds that are alternating. So it forms a conjugated pi electron system over the whole ring. So the electrons are delocalized over the whole ring. Essentially what you have is a particle on the ring. But now, the, what I'll show you in a moment is if you will distort this ring slightly, you can completely change this spectral properties of the system. This long tail, essentially, the function of that is just to hook the chlorophyll at its uh, precise position inside the protein scaffold, protein matrix. Okay, the two molecular axes are called the y and x axis, and they correspond to the two main transition light components, qy and qx. Okay, so here are QY and QX, two main transition light moments. And we also have sorry bands, that's just a mixture of different polarization states. Okay, and very remarkable of these chlorophylls, and they have very high mode extension coefficients. Um, does this tell you anything? Extension coefficient is directly related to an absorption coefficient, which is directly related to the absorption cross section. Okay, it just determines your. Uh, well, how well the system can absorb light. So it's a high extinction curve, we should say, it absorbs light very well? Or yes, yes. Doesn't distinguish. Yeah. Okay. Um,
property which is very unusual for S1 states. So QI is essentially be S1 states. So the first excited state. And you also notice we have very sharp absorption bands, which are the cause of this five conjugated system. Okay, these bands we have the QY band, QX band, and very sorry bands. Okay, so this is the one pigment. And now both A and B are the two different protocols in plants, and they just differ by this one is the group. So proper A gets the CH3, proper B gets CHO, and by changing this rate of uh, we have a pretty remarkable change in the absorption spectrum. So proper A of the blue spectrum, by just distorting this high electron system slightly, we shift the bands, QI, QY bands, by about 20 nanometers to the blue, and the SORA band about 20 nanometers to the, to, to the red. Okay, but now because these pigments are embedded inside a protein matrix, proteins are highly, um, yeah, um, highly charged matrices. So at every every position, the pigment experiences a different environment. This is called the local protein environment. Okay, now we have seen how strongly these uh, spectroscopic properties can be changed by distorting this ring. The, the local protein environment will distort the, the properties of every single chlorophyll. So if we would look at the different stick-like spectra or stick-like absorption bands of the different chlorophylls, so there are supposed to be 14 bands. And um, okay, uh, this is now running from high energy to low energy. So chlorophyll Bs are here in blue, chlorophyll A's are in red. And this is the so-called site energy of every chlorophyll. So they are all different because they all experience a unique protein environment. So this is one very important factor of the protein. It's a highly heterogeneous environment. Okay, and it, it determines the site energy of the transition dipole moment of every single chlorophyll. It actually tunes that. So that's one issue I'll come back to later. Yes. An instance where the this order is, 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 is a good thing because it broadens the, the, the... Exactly, the yes, yes, yes. Yeah, it's, it's an important point to make. Because if you have only um, one transition dipole moment, you have a, a very narrow absorption band. But, but now the protein is responsible for um, extending this absorption over, um, across a very large uh, region of the, of the solar spectrum. Okay, Jablonski diagram, is this familiar to all of you? Okay, all the people in photonics, yes. Okay, well, it's basically a diagram just showing you the, the, the main processes, uh, all of the main um, um, electronic and vibrational energy bands. Okay, S0 is the ground state, S1 is the first excited state, and the high excited states. Okay, from high excited states to the um, Lowest excited states, uh, after excitation, you have very fast internal convergence, normally on the range of hundreds of femtoseconds. Okay. You have vibrational relaxation up to the lowest vibrational level. The solvent relaxation, which is mostly responsible for the sort of stoke shift, so it lowers the energy. And then there's a shift between the absorption and the fluorescence maxima. Okay, and then stimulated emission. I'll be familiar with just for instance, um, some one type of fluorescence. But in the system crossing to a triplet state, so just the flip of one of of the spin off one of your latest electrons. Okay, and if that relaxes you have phosphorescence. So these are the main processes in in a chromophore. Okay, absorption. This should also be familiar to all the physicists around, so I'm not going to elaborate a lot on this. So absorption is basically determined between a, between a transition dipole moment in the space between energy levels 1 and 2 and the incidence in um, electric fields. Okay, of course it depends strongly on the angle between the two because we have a dot product and I'm also introducing a line shape function which I will come back to tomorrow. This is essentially a statistical distribution of the transition frequencies. 
This is because of um, yeah, basically because of disorder in the system, energetic disorder coupled to structural disorder, and you get um, yeah, homogeneous disorder, heterogeneous disorder, and that's mainly responsible for broadening your absorption peaks, the line shape function, which you normally model model with a Lorentzian or Gaussian, you know, depending on the type of disorder. Come back to that tomorrow. Yeah. Okay, the Einstein coefficients, that's also something that should be familiar to all of you. So you have the Einstein coefficients for spontaneous emission, absorption, stimulated emission. So if you just consider these three basic processes, consider them thermal equilibrium, you can get a direct relationship between all three of them. Um, and the changes between them are just um, uh, due to factors of all different um, universal constants. Okay. So, what is remarkable, if you, no, I as an incrementalist appreciate this, is that these constants all depend strongly on your extinction coefficient, so essentially your absorption coefficient, and this is something that can be measured. Your extinction or your absorption coefficient, but basically what this is, this is just integrating over your whole absorption band. And this is basically what it is. And from this, you get these other Einstein coefficients. So you get the uh, you know, different rate constants, as I showed here, for spontaneous emission, absorption, and stimulated emission. Okay. Um, now, just to say one thing about the excited state lifetime of the chlorophylls. Okay, so just taking the three primary processes fluorescence, <coughs> internal conversion, and through the system crossing, so formation of the triplet state. So the total lifetime of the excited state um, yes, is the inverse of the total rate constant, which is the inverse of the sum of the um, different rate constant in this process. Of course, if you have another decay channel of your excited state, you just add another uh, rate constant there. Okay, so for chlorophyll, if it is solubilized, for example, an organic solvent like ethanol it has a much larger lifetime than in a protein environment. Remember, the protein functions as an environment, it changes the, the spectroscopic properties of these pigments. So, solubilized in an organic solvent, the lifetime is about 5 milliseconds. Okay, and the different components are then about 30% fluorescence, 60% formation of triplet state, and 10% internal conversion. Right. In, a, in a protein environment, the lifetime reduces to about 3 nanoseconds, and so it's still pretty long compared to the, the time it takes until you have the child separated state. So this is your, your main limiting factor. The child recombination which takes place on a time scale of less than a nanosecond. But of course, the whole process should also be much faster than the lifetime of the chlorophyll, of spontaneous emission. Otherwise your energy will be lost in the form of residence. Now under normal sunlight conditions, uh, what is normal again, but then the probability of residence is less than a half percent. So it means that this loss channel is very small and all the other energy is used by the system. Okay. This is another point I will come back to, so the combination of chlorophyll lights and oxygen is lethal. And that's why photoprotective mechanisms have to be switched on. Carotenoids are other interesting chromophore. So these are stick-like molecules. Now the conjugate ion electron system is in the middle. They are alternatively again as double and single bonds. Here are three um, carotenoids that are very prominent in plants, right also complexes. It's a protein in the reaction center, and routine at the axon in our in antenna systems also in the reaction center. Okay. A beta carotene, just as an aside, um, is a very important uh, molecule also for us for photoprotection. So you have um, if you would eat them or well, Carrots contain a lot of things, that's actually where the main protein comes from. And if you eat them, then your body breaks it down and more or less splits it in half. And when you split beta carotene in half, then you have retinol or retinol or, or these similar forms. 
So retinol, that should ring a bell. That is a molecule, if you would take the rod cells, and the back of the rod cells, you have a folded membrane containing hundreds of millions of the so-called rhodopsin molecule. And inside the rhodopsin molecule, it's a, it's a protein and it's a pigment inside, which is retinol. This is just one half of the protein, a bit of the So the moral of this story is, eat your, eat your carrots. Glasses. Okay, carotenoids are very important molecules. They have different, uh, many different functions, and they are responsible for all the bright colors we see around. Okay, also they uh, are very um, important in our eyes because if it were not for carotenoids, they we would have gone blind if we were exposed to bright sunlight. Okay, yeah, and birds and fishes have some other functions as well, and it was. Only quite recently that people started to, to realize the importance of carotenoids also for health issues. So in person, yes, they are interested in, they are responsible for extending the absorption and um, cross-section of your further system, so responsible for life harvesting. For further protection, it's probably the most important um, function and then also for sterilization and some other functions in other organisms. Okay, so how do they extend their absorption cross section? Well, they have different transition dipole moments, and especially in the green region, which plants do not cover. Okay, so photoprotection is probably the most important function of them. So if there were not carotenoids present in plants, in your eyes, okay, especially in plants if you deal with chlorophyll, now what happens with the if a triplet state of chlorophyll is formed, then it very readily reacts with oxygen. Um, okay, to, to form a singlet oxygen state. So you know that oxygen in its ground state is the triplet form because it has two two valence um, electrons that should be in different orbitals. Okay, but now if they react with with triplet state chlorophyll, then uh, single oxygen is formed, which is lethal. It, it just destroys almost anything. So the plants and our eyes, or well, well, most living systems, contain carotenoids to, to protect themselves from, from single oxygen. And there are two ways in which carotenoids can do this. They can quench triplet chlorophyll to form single chlorophyll again, or they can quench uh, oxygen. So single oxygen to form triplet oxygen again. Okay, so this is one of the most important for the protective um, functions of carotenoids. Okay, carotenoids are not the easiest systems to model. So this stick-like structure with the rings on the side, um, although they are geometrically very um, symmetric, they are very difficult to, to model. And people are making a lot of, of approximations in modeling. But um, one important aspect is the um, complex electronic um, energy diagram. So, so you have the S0 ground state, this one is two. Um, normally, excitation takes place from S0 to S2 because the first one is symmetry forbidden. Okay, you have relaxation, it's on a pretty fast time scale. Um, okay, this carotenoid are a slightly dispersed couple to the to chlorophyll. Because the key Y base of the chlorophyll are normally uh, lower in energy than this one, so all the energy will be transferred to the chlorophyll. It's on a very fast time scale. All these things can be experimentally measured. But now the, the extra in, um, energy levels in these systems that are not present in other types of chlorophylls um, are related to their symmetry. And it's only pretty recently that many of these extra energy levels have been discovered. For example, here's one sort of star state, which was discovered only about 15 years ago. And after this, also in many other, other systems as well. And then the 1 mu minus state was discovered last year. Okay, it was predicted theoretically a few years before that, or 20 years before that, but only last year it was actually confirmed experimentally. Does exist. Ok, 
Okay, pigment density is another important design principle. Okay. If you would consider a protein, the, the large number of, of molecules it, it contains compared to pigments, then in order to have a, a, a mass of more than 30% of the whole system of pigment, means that the different pigments should be very close to that. Pigment density should be very high. Okay. And you get a center to center distance of these chlorophylls of about one nanometer, and very often it is even less than that. <coughs> okay, if you consider the main light opposite complex again, and it's two, then the chlorophylls have a molar density, a molar concentration of about half a mole, which is extremely high. There was a study that was made almost 30 years ago. Um, uh, in, in which free chlorophylls were taken. Okay, and if they are isolated and solubilized, um, they have a very high fluorescent efficiency. Okay. Now, if you would increase the concentration until you reach the concentration that it has inside the protein, then you end up here, which is essentially zero fluorescence. And this is called concentration quenching because of the, the very high density. The, the chlorophylls will just quench one another if one is excited. Okay, but this is exactly what, what the chlorophyll concentration is inside this protein. So you see again one of the very important functions of the protein, that is to, to ensure this very high density of pigments simultaneously with a very high efficiency of energy transfer and absorption. Also, because of protein scaffold, protein environment, you shift the for the reasons efficiency from about 0 to 100% on the scale. Okay, the last thing I would like to look at, and I'm still almost running out of time, is functional regulation. The most important feature of that is color protection. Functional regulation, if you see this word, a protein should immediately flash in your mind, because regulation is mainly based or on this level, it is basically based on protein dynamics. So, let me, uh, let's have a brief look at the light housing protein. So, this is the light housing protein in LH2, again, covering the, the chlorophylls, represented by the rings here, and the stick like structure of water mode. Okay, so we have already seen that it creates a highly uh, heterogeneous environment, and by this it um, extends the absorption band, system and every pigment experiences uh, an essentially unique environment. Okay, second important aspect is that crystal structures are actually averages and they can give us a false notion. It's very nice for modeling aspects because then you can theoretically start to appreciate um, many of much of the dynamics, many of the processes that take place. But these systems are averages of a very large number of different configurations. Because living systems are all um, wiggly systems, as Feynman has once pointed out. Um, and the proteins especially are, are fluctuating very much. Okay, this um, brings us to the concept of disorder, uh, which very strongly contrasts these systems from, as I mentioned in the beginning, crystalline semiconductors that we are used to, which, um, in which you try to get rid of most disorder, get, try to get rid of impurities in these things. But um, as I'll show you later during my, the lecture series, that disorder is actually used by these systems um, to switch between different functions. Very remarkable feature. Okay, proteins are in fact nano switches. A nice word to use if you're writing grant proposals. Nano switch, so just nanoscale switches, because proteins are switches. They switch between functional uh, and non-functioning states, or they switch their function on and off. And in some cases, you get multifunctional proteins, like light, light arsenic complexes are multifunctional proteins, consists of multifunctional proteins, so they can switch between different functions. Okay, and two most important functions are light harvesting and photoprotection. protection. And they can make this switch also extremely efficiently. So switching from about 100% light harvesting efficiency 
to about 10% light hours in efficiency. Okay, and then there are environmental sensors. So, how is this functionality determined? Okay, well, the protein senses the environment in which it's embedded, and based on that, it will determine which function it should have. So, it senses the environment and then it switches between different functions. And then, functional switches. Um, can be described very well in the concept of the conformational energy landscape, which is a hypersurface of your free energy as a function of um, all your different conformational coordinates or degrees of freedom. So every degree of freedom is giving you another, um, another coordinate. And this is just a project projection onto one conformational coordinate. But basically what it tells you conceptually is that um, the, the dynamics, conformational dynamics are divided into different tiers in a hierarchy. Okay, the, the large domain movements correspond to the largest energy barriers. So in order to cross from one local minimum to the other one, you have to cross the energy barrier. Okay, but now as you zoom into smaller scale motions, which also occur on smaller time scales, the um, the, the energy barriers become smaller and smaller. So it, it, it's almost like fractals. You start with the large domain motions, and as you zoom in, you get to the small domain motions. But, but every time you have to, to cross these energy barriers in, in order to, to have a confirmation change. So a functional change then corresponds to crossing such an energy barrier to another confirmation coordinate where that coordinate is then coupled to another function. Okay, which brings us to energy regulation, so switching on and off of the light harvesting capability of the system. And these are my last couple of slides. Um, what these figures are showing are two different leaves that have been measured. And uh, the irradiance striking these leaves um, is shown here as a function of the time of day. This is for a leaf at the bottom of a tree. So you have a whole canopy of leaves on top of it, and this is for leaf on top of, of a tree. And well, okay, you will expect this that as you proceed through the day the, the light intensity will change dramatically. But, but now leaves that are normally in the shade um, below some other leaves, if, if the wind will blow, then you will get um, these very fast fluctuations of energy. And the plant should be able to, to regulate that. And as I said in the beginning, the most efficient way to regulate this is to, to make the systems um, function optimally under low light conditions. So only the first couple of hours in the day and the last couple of hours, you have the maximum for the The rest of the time, most of this energy is dissipated, you see, it's thermal dissipation. And that is just to protect the system. Otherwise, you produce a lot of these reactive oxygen species, the reaction center gets destroyed, the whole cell gets destroyed eventually. So on the molecular scale, that's where the very fast switching on and off of the light harvesting efficiency should be regulated. And this is the level on which most of my research is. So we are looking at the protein functional switches, and the switches between these different states. And so too much of a good thing it's often bad. It's too much light, light is essential for the plant, but too much of it is very bad. So if the gradients level increases, the photosynthesis increases until it saturates, and at some time, at uh, so some point you get for inhibition. Okay, and how this is switched on? Photo protection is actually a combination of a whole bunch of processes on all different levels of organization but a very complex chain of events happens. So if you consider the particle membrane again, so proteins that are shuttled through the membrane. So on this side, on the luminal side, we have a pull of, of proteins. If the light intensity is too much, it means that the proteins cannot be used um, fast enough. It, it simply is um, faster, it can't be used fast enough. Or, um, it's used slower than it produced, then you get the buildup. So essentially what happens is pH drops. The pH on this side is constant, it's normally about pH 8. On this side, normally drops to about pH 5, at which photoprotection is switched on completely. Okay, non 
quenching is the most important mechanism on a molecular scale. It consists of three parts. So the main part is called the interdependent one. We also have so-called state transitions. So this is a physical movement of the LH2 trimer between the different photosystems. And then it also contains the photoinhibited part where the reaction center or some other parts are inhibited, they are destroyed, and it has to be recreated and the system reassembled again. Okay, I'm not going to go into detail in all of this, but just for you to appreciate the, the bit of the complexity. So the delta pH triggers the main component of the it induces the so-called xanthophyll cycle, which means that by xanthine, what you have on a dermite condition is converted into zeaxanthine, that means an enzyme. So basically what happens is that the number of conjugated bonds changes, and thereby the function of this carotene changes. Okay, that also happens, of course you have uh, too high concentration of protons, the antenna systems are protonated, so there's another protein called the PSPS that's protonated. It's all rearrangement and aggregation of your antenna systems that take place, and eventually you also get recovery from damage. Okay, and these things happen on different time scales. Okay. Now, regulatory dissipation, mainly not particular equation, is responsible for the main energy loss in these systems. So, if you would like to use these principles to eventually uh, use to create your own electricity from it, to drive cars in this stage, to the maximum efficiency, quantum efficiency, from absorption of photon to carbon fixation, about 25%. Now, of course, of all the energy loss processes, Picking up with less than 1%. So, one of the main advances in this field is to understand this regulated dissipation, despite a lot of research that's not fully understood yet, and then to be able to control this. Because if you can control this, you can dramatically increase this percentage. Okay, and then the last principle, which it I will come back to tomorrow. Right, this was quite a mouthful, I think, um, especially, especially all the biology that it contained to create the context. Are there any questions? Yeah, I think there are questions already, but they must be one or two more. After 20 minutes, it starts to create yeah. oxygen. Yeah. <laughs> it would be some kind of shock that couldn't be with this kind of effect, right? Because what the kind of type there. of plant is it? Itself. I'm just looking at one small part of it on a molecular level. There are many other levels of the process taking place. So, but this is probably very fast, right? It's a very fast switching, yes. Until the process is, is um, fully switched on, because that's an aspect I will come back to in my last presentation, because of the disorder in the system, it, it um, continuously switches on and off random times, but the local environment controls the switching process, so until it has optimized this fast component of, uh, of non human quenching, it, it can take up to 100 seconds, so, which is a, a very slow time scale compared to the, the dynamics of excitation energy transfer, but the switching itself is very fast. So where the buildup of oxygen comes in more now the thing the biochemists are supposed to tell you that. Well, thank you very much. Uh, the period is here for the whole week, so lots of questions about these amazing processes and uh, also what we worked uh, for the chemistry of tea times too and there are these remaining three lectures this, mm -hmm. this week. Thank you very much.